great to, to be able to welcome you, Jason, to this virtual interview. And we're grateful to you for finding the time to speak to us today. Since March, um, you've become a household name in Scotland as the National Clinical Director of the Scottish Government. And you're at the forefront of coordinating the Scottish Government's public health response to the coronavirus, playing a vital role in keeping the nation informed of what we need to do to stay safe and what we can all do together to slow the spread of this virus. I'm sure that there are lots of people who would claim to be the busiest person in Scotland right now, but you must be amongst those who would make the shortlist for that title. Um, you graduated in dentistry from the University in Glasgow in 1991 and became a fellow of the Faculty of Dental Surgeons um, at the Royal College of Surgeons in 1996. However, your career path turned towards public health and you received a doctorate from the University of Glasgow a Master's in Public Health from Harvard and you're a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Good to keep a foot in both the East and West camps. You're also a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and have worked for the Scottish Government since 2007, holding a number of clinical roles. And during my research for today's interview, I was interested to see that you're a Director of the Nazareth Trust and a trustee of the Indian Rural Evangelical Fellowship. And these reveal something else about you that's interesting, and that's your Christian faith. In 2019, you received a CBE for services to healthcare and charity, which must have been a particular highlight coming second only to appearing on BBC Radio Scotland with Stuart and Tam and Off the Ball. Um, you're obviously a football fan, um, so without any further ado, let me play you in with a beautifully weighted first question. Um, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Where was home for you when you were growing up? Um, and what was family life like for you? So that's a very, very generous introduction first, Pete. Let me, let me say it's a great, a, a great privilege to be here. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be able to give some kind of insight and some kind of answers to your questions. I do apologise for being a household name. I, I, despite what people might think, I didn't seek it. It kind of landed when the music stopped and the global pandemic appeared. Here I was as the National Clinical Director and none of us from the Director General of the WHO through to the CMO in Scotland and me, we didn't expect to be here. So fa family life was fairly conventional, actually. My father's from Dunfermline. My mother's from the East End of Glasgow. They're both Nazarenes for the nature of this conversation. Uh, and they met at Nazarene Youth Camp many, many years ago now. And we, my father was a coal miner. My grandfather was a coal miner. My great grandfather was a coal miner. Uh, my father realized coal mining was maybe not going to last long enough for him. So he became an electrical engineer. Subsequently in life, long story short, became an engineering lecturer, in fact, and did his degree uh, kind of when I did mine. And he was the second person in the family to go to university after his son, which is how it often worked in slightly working class environments in the east and west of Scotland. So actually, I was born in the Midlands of England because he was there looking for work in Leicester. Lived there for three months. Didn't remember a whole lot about it. Then North Devon for six years. Barnstable Baptist. First Barnstable Boys Brigade started by my dad. In fact, I mentioned it in an interview recently, and somebody this week from Barnstable Baptist got in touch, which was lovely, a family that knew us when we were little kids. And then back to Scotland. And on this occasion, we moved back to Lanarkshire, somewhere between Dunfermline and the East End. We went to Airdrie, and that's where I spent most of my uh, youth. I went to school there. I went to church there. I went from there to university. I went from there to get married. So Airdrie and Airdrie Baptist has always been pretty close to my heart. In fact, we still worship there. That's still where I have a connection, even though my wife and I now live in Glasgow. We still travel to our family church in Airdrie. So it sounds as though um, the Christian faith was something that featured prominently um, in your upbringing through your parents' influence. Um, you know, what, what did it mean to you when you were growing up to have that Christian faith, that, to, to have that connection to church and, and to watch your parents worship and, and serve in the way that you clearly saw? Yeah, so multiple generations, really, not, not just mum and dad, but the, the layer above them as well. My, my father's mum, my gran, and my, my father, my mother's mum and dad, my, my mother's father, so my grandfather, 
was the treasurer of the Nazarene Church in Scotland. So faith and service linked, and we'll probably come back to that, faith and service linked everywhere I looked. So my father's never been a passive churchgoer. He's always been in leadership uh, and uh, chaired something or been a deacon. And my mum has always served, even, even now in her late 70s, serving in the mother and toddlers group of our own fellowship in Airdrie. So it, there's always been a connection there with ch ch church isn't just for going, church is for serving. And I think I, I, I realised that from a very, very early age. I, I, I mean, I was conventional. I went to Sunday school. I was taken along to what we called the Christian Endeavour, which was the kind of teenage group and then youth groups. I, and then Airdrie struggled for a few years. There weren't many people my age, uh, except my now wife, in fact. Uh, and she would suggest I, I was all that was left. But that would be harsh, I think. And, and Queen's Park Baptist, which some people will, will know who are, who are watching this, Queen's Park Baptist, a big, uh, for those days, in the, in the, what would be the late 80s, a big youth-focused church with Edwin Gunn as the pastor, who's now become a great friend. And I, I went there on Sunday nights after our own church. My father would drive me in, drop me at the youth event, and then come back for me later on, it, because he realised that to keep me connected, I needed to have my own relationships. And Queen's Park Baptist also became very, very important to me. Lots of friends from there who I've, who I've still kept in touch with, even, even to this day, many years later. So growing up, your parents obviously had an influence on your faith. You talked about your dad and um, being from uh, coal mining stock. Um, and I've got this image of people going into dark places with picks. Is that why you pursued a career in dentistry? Um, and you started it, off with dentistry. And then obviously your career path turned more in the direction of um, the area of public health. So, so what was it that attracted you to dentistry? And then what was it that caused you to kind of take this different road into into the arena of public health? So I'm not I'm not sure I have a good answer for the first part of that. I've been asked that many times, particularly recently. I, I, I don't know. I was 16 years old looking for something to do with a decent set of hires. And I ended up in medicine, dentistry, law. I, I, I didn't know. We had no healthcare people in our families. We had It was pretty random, to be honest. Now, you and I would know, but perhaps not quite as random as it seemed at the time. But, but it, it felt random when I was doing it. My grandfather, who I just mentioned, actually, had just died. And it was the first loss I'd ever experienced. And I can remember that decision-making being related to that, but not specifically i mean he he was he was a further education lecturer and mechanical engineer so it wasn't that he he chose it for me in any meaningful way the the second bit of your answer is because de dentistry i loved it the best years of my life at university i then went out and did a little bit of dental practice and realized 40 years of this is not going to go well this this 8 foot by 8 foot room this is going to be a bit constraining so I went back and did oral surgery. So I did head and neck surgery for many years, working as a, a trainee in the big hospitals in Glasgow for years, doing trauma and people hitting each other and helping with big cancer operations. And then back into the dental school, did an academic job, lots of teaching, lots of research, did my thesis, and then had the opportunity to go to the States. Uh, and not, not really in an ordered way, but partly because I was bored. And I ended up at a, a company, a not-for-profit organization in Boston, in Massachusetts, and that gave me the opportunity to do a master's in public health. And that really opened my mind to the layers beyond the individual care. And I, I knew all of that because I had seen multiple people come with the same fractured jaw that they'd come three months ago. We, well, that can't be right. We, we can't be just repairers. There has to be something else about health and care. And that, that's what public health, that's why public health attracted me. I did some of the best education of my life there about equity, about inequalities in African-American health care, about the ethics of what we do when we vaccinate a population. Or Little did I know that it, from 2005, six to 2020, I would then end up in a maelstrom of a global pandemic along with thousands and thousands of others. Came back to... He had a part-time job in the government doing healthcare safety, then healthcare quality, and then here we are, National Clinical Director of the Healthcare System in a, a triad of senior clinical advisors to the government, the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Nursing Officer, and the National Clinical Director. 
So do you think that while you were in Boston and you, you got a greater insight into the area of public health, that actually that then stirred within you something that you've mentioned already, which was sort of that element of service. You talked about service and faith going sort of hand in hand, if you like. So do you think that, you know, that that period of study broadened your mind and opened your horizons to, to that, to bringing forward those those elements of service and faith together? I think probably the values system was there before. I mean, I'd start, we'll maybe come to India. I'd started going to India to to help in an orphanage pretty much as soon as I qualified and had any skills that the world needed. So that was way back in 93, 92, 93. What, what, what the public health education and public health experience does for you is it, is it raises you above the clinic and hospital layer, which is completely essential and, and not to downplay that world at all. I mean, you, you cannot run a health and care system if you don't have community nurses going in to change dressings in people's houses, of course. But at some level, you have to start talking about damp housing and addiction counselling and the criminal justice system if you're actually going to affect the people who have those ulcers in their homes. So, so that's what it begins to teach for you. You begin to think about uh, knife violence in an entirely new way because it's not about repair. You need repair. Of course you do. But, but you have to think about going upstream, if you'll forgive the cliche, to try and to try and prevent the knife crime happening in the first place. And that that's a, a multifactorial, long conversation and lecture about what public health actually is. And that, that's what got me interested in system change and how, how we might do that for you know, conventional times, the quality of the delivery system, the integration of health and care, all of those things that I was doing before. And here we are in the middle of what, what is a completely unique time in living history. To, to try and apply those methods to a global pandemic that is treating people unequally, just like every other disease. So when the UK entered lockdown in, in March and the Scottish government began to implement restrictions to control the spread of the virus, you became much more visible um, as a figure in public life in Scotland. And almost every decision that's taken um, to respond to the effects of the virus change some aspects of the lives of the people in Scotland and often have quite significant personal and economic consequences. And not unreasonably, those decisions which you have a hand in shaping um, are under close public and media scrutiny. How do you cope with that pressure? And are there particular principles that you have learned and picked up along the way that you use to help guide you um, through that pressure? And, and while you're you're taking difficult decisions under such close scrutiny, it's a big it's a big question, and, and it's uh, there is good and bad in there, of course. I mean, if you if you put your head above the parapet into these types of jobs, and and there's people doing this job in Slovakia and New Zealand and England and Scotland, so it's not it's not unique. There's people working much much harder than me in care homes and intensive care units today to deal with what is a, a second wave of this horrific virus. I mean, we, we, had, we have about 80 people in intensive care tonight with COVID who, who may well die of this disease. So you need to keep it in perspective, but, but it, it is high stakes and I'm in rooms that I, I had been in before, but briefly, now I'm in them all the time. And there's quite a lot of difficult advice to give and there is uncertainty in that advice. This, despite what the amateur epidemiologists might suggest, there are few binary choices here. It is very, very complex. It's a novel virus. We don't know exactly what it does and how it does it. We don't know exactly how to find it. And everything we do has, as you say, societal and economic consequences. So when you give your advice, the, what, the fundamental value you have to bring is tell the truth. So my mum told me when I was a little boy, at times of crisis, son, revert to the truth, because it's the only bit you'll remember. So, so that, that serves me well. So tell the truth as you know it in the moment. Now that means if you replay an interview of mine from March, you might find that that gives a little bit of a different piece of advice than it gives in the middle of October. And that's something you have to face in these jobs. The politicians face that every day. That was kind of new for me to have that level of scrutiny. I am still being tweeted or interviewed in the media when they play something back to me that I said in March. So you, you, you just have to kind of roll through that and try and do it. So today is an interesting case in point. I said on the radio this morning that 
a normal family, multi-household Christmas, lots of people gathering, that, that seems unlikely in the present pandemic. So that is Christmas is cancelled in all, in all the media today. So, so I think what I said was correct, but Christmas isn't cancelled. I mean, it, given, given my faith, I mean, you, you can't cancel Christmas. It's impossible. No, even the First Minister can't cancel Christmas. What we may have to do is adapt Christmas. And, we, uh, and that will be true of churches and it will be true of families. So, so it's just an illustration of, of how you have to deal with that in the media. And I, I've tried, you mentioned off the ball at the beginning. I think one of the things we've done on off the ball is try and speak to a very broad demographic about the nature of a global pandemic and do it sometimes very seriously by talking about death and mortality. And sometimes we've talked about the Bruins and whether they're allowed to go on holiday. But that, that's the nature of communication to a five and a half million person population. I mean, I think it's interesting listening to you hearing about everybody's opinions. I mean, before, before we um, started this formal part of the interview, we, we talked about that. It must be very challenging, you know, having um, operating in a sphere and um, taking difficult decisions um, and you know, everybody having an opinion on every single decision um, that you've made. And I'm sure there'll be lots of people out there who have lots of opinions about the, the decisions that have been taken and announced today. And um, just coming back to that point, you know, um, the, what, what you learned um, tied to your mother's apron strings, you know, about telling the truth. When things got difficult, always rely on the truth. My mother used to tell me, be sure your sins will find you out. I'm not sure what that says about maybe the difference between you and I, Jason. Um, Moving on, um, one of the things that I was interested in was just to find out from you what highlights you've had in your career to date. Um, obviously, being appointed National Clinical Director must be one, and then obviously receiving the CBE another. Um, are there things that you can point to um, that along the way have, have been real highlights for you, moments that you kind of cherish and hang on to in the difficult times? I think some of the... Uh... A couple of the things you've you've mentioned in organisations that I've been involved with. I mean, the the the, the Scottish journey, the career journey, it, it's not entirely unconventional. A lot of people have done that. Perhaps not ended up in the senior government position, but it's not completely unheard of. I mean, there are there are some real highlights in there with working with thousands of people to drive down hospital acquired infections, to drive down mortality from harm across Scotland using the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. One, wonderful pieces of work that I, I've been a tiny part of leading with hosts of others. The, the other place I go to for uh, counselling in my own head is the work in India. So I've been involved in a children's home, school, nursing school, college in India for nearly 25 years now with a whole host of kids who have been through that process, who have, who have come to that orphanage with nothing and then left with a biology degree or a teaching qualification. And to be involved in a small way with an Indian organization run by Indians, run by Christians in India, started by a, a guy called Prasada Rao, now run by his son, who's a great pal. And the board meeting of that is this evening. So I will sit around some spreadsheets of the money we're giving, about how we're maybe going to plan for another trip after COVID and all of those things. And then the other uh, charity, big involvement is the Nazareth Trust. It, it, we don't have time to talk about it much, but it... It's a hospital in Arab Israeli Nazareth, uh, built by a Scottish medical graduate. He was Armenian, in fact, but he trained at Edinburgh University and known in the town as the Scottish Hospital and has been for hundreds of years. And I'm on the board of that hospital trying to help the Arab Israeli population get the health care that they need and deserve in a, in a relatively mixed demographic environment in the north of Israel. And it's been a huge privilege to be there and think about how they might build a new dialysis unit just now, how they might get through COVID and how they would build new intensive care units and all of that and learn about an Israeli health system. They do clinics in the West Bank, mobile clinics in the West Bank, etc. So, so those, those, the privileges that these jobs, like the one I'm in just now, give you to, to be able to give something back eh, to, to those kinds of environments are priceless. And, and if I'm, if I'm feeling a bit downtrodden by trolling or uh, people people questioning the advice, that's that's where I go in my head. Thanks, Jason. I mean, that's that should be interesting. It's quite fascinating listening to you talk about that because actually these ideas of service and faith 
you know, these are the, the drivers for you in your professional life, but also apparently, you know, in your private life, in your involvement in these ministry areas, um, which are very much geared to, to improving um, the lot for people in life um, and, uh, and doing what you can to contribute that. So, you know, it, it seems to be a theme that runs throughout your DNA, if you like. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about these Christian organisations that you're involved in. Um, how is your faith? Um, affected your your career um, how is your how how is that um, interwoven in, in the everyday stuff of of life when you know you, you you think again about what the sun headline might be for you tomorrow well the sun headline tomorrow will be uh, i'm the grinch that that this british i could write it i could write it for them i've been doing this long enough now that i can all, i can almost design the front cover of of the sun for tomorrow and and th that will be done in good spirits. That's that's not that's not a bad thing. That's the nature of tabloid journalism, and I I'm I'm entirely comfortable with it. The the ones I struggle with actually are I actually don't mind people uh, uh, arguing or discussing because there are there are different scientific views. The the straight abuse is quite hard to take. The the questioning your motives, the suggesting you're doing it for some ulterior reason, some political thing. I've been. I've been a raving nationalist and a raving unionist in equal measure. So, so those are the ones that kind of get you down a little bit. They're they're a little bit exhausting. Faith is is I think central to to all of the values and decision making I've done throughout my life. I've got that wrong often, of course, as have we all. But it, but it drives who who I try to be in my own family, in the church that I help support, and in the decision making and the the conversations I'm having with the deputy first minister about how we might uh, use our local authorities to make the world a better place. I mean, it, 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 in all of those conversations, your your value system, whether it's faith-based or otherwise, has, has to be part of that. And for me, that, that's from a core of a, of a belief, a Baptist church, a relatively conventional evangelical background that people could, people could probably guess where the theology comes from. You can probably see over my, over my uh, right uh, shoulder here, we've got a new international version of the Bible and Grudem's system, system, systemic theology. I mean, it's not, it's not hard to understand the faith background I've come from. There's also Kafka and Bill Bryson in the top shelf, so there's a fairly broad set of reading materials. Um, I'm sure it will have a wide appeal to the people who've been, who've been watching this. I've done a couple of these interviews um, and the, the two folks that I've interviewed um, before you um, were very kind enough to share sort of scripture verses and um, passages from the Bible which um, have come to mean a lot for them over the years, things that they, they bring back to mind time and time again um, and explained why um, they hold that significance for them. And I was, you know, you're talking about your NIV on the on the shelf over your left shoulder. Um, are there any particular verses of, of scripture that are that are important and special for you? And, and so, Peter, I'm going to let myself down because it's in Mark, but I'm not sure what verse it is. You might, this will be a test for you. So it's, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Do you know where that is? It's, uh, that's the that's the one that's come to mind. So we can do the verse, and then you can look you can look for it subsequently. And yeah, uh, no, we'll, we'll do that, and we'll 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 put it up. So the so point. the story the story is the the man who loses is is Jairus's daughter, and he his 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 daughter is dead, and and Jesus Jesus talks to him, and he says, uh, "Do you do you do you believe?" And he says, "I believe, comma, help me in my unbelief." So. It, that's an that's an odd sentence, but it but it I think it epitomizes those who tell the truth about Christianity or whatever faith they follow. It, it's not binary. You don't wake up every day thinking this is I, I get it. I understand it all. Thank thank goodness I I did this when I was seven years old and my dad showed me the way. I mean that's that's it's simply not human. So so I so I have those same doubts. I have those same moments of joy and belief. And I and I think the contrast between the two. Is is why I like it. the The other place I would go immediately is James, and and faith without works is dead, and that's been one of the themes we've we've described. I I I am attracted to organised religion, only in the sense that it provides a way of providing care and service to others. So so of course we should have worship services. Of course we should have preachers and prayer times. But if you haven't got a food bank at the same time, I'm not entirely sure why you're doing it. 
No, I mean, that's really, that's really great. Um, I mean, I like that passage in James, which also talks about, you know, the religion that's acceptable to God is the one that looks after the widow and the orphan um, and fixes its mind on, on, on God's values and God's principles. Um, Jason, that concludes um, the formal part of this interview. Um, thank you very much for the time that you've spent with us. You've obviously got a board meeting that you now need to go and read some papers for and prepare um, your thoughts on. Um, let me just say a huge thank you for not only making yourself available to be with us um, and to talk with us just now, um, but also on behalf of the people of Scotland for all that you're doing. Um, as I said, it must be quite a thankless task often um, when everybody's got an opinion um, and you know, some of them share that in ways which are more civilised and, and kind than others. Um, but we are tremendously grateful for all that you're, that you're doing um, and, you know, you will continue to do um, for the benefit. And, and, you know, often, you know, we, we see you on the television, we hear you on the radio. Um, but I think today we've been given an insight into, into you um, and to your motives and to the things that drive you. One of the things that you commented on there was, find it difficult when people question your motives. But clearly the idea of service and faith, both in your professional and your private life, go hand in hand. Um, and actually there's just that stream of consistency throughout. So it's been terrific to get a chance to speak to you, Jason. Um, keep on going and we'll do our best to help you in every way and any way that we can. Um, and thank you again. Thanks for having me.